Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm standing in Ottawa in front of the uh, Dow's Lake uh, Pavilion. Beautiful sunset uh, behind me, as you can see. You know, it's just gorgeous. And in this video, I'm going to talk all about the uh, 1918 uh, so-called Spanish influenza or Spanish lady pandemic in relation to what's happening in the present uh, pandemic uh, with the coronavirus. And uh, there's been quite a few uh, things that are happening in parallel. Um, it's like history is being um, repeated in some cases. And I hope uh, it doesn't continue to repeat um, because in 1918, the first wave, which was in the spring um, 1918, was relatively tame. And when the second wave came in the fall, it came with a vengeance. And most of the deaths during the entire pandemic, which consisted of the three waves, occurred in the second wave. You know, a factor of 10 times higher, at least, number of infections and number of people killed. Um, in the second wave, which happened in the fall of 1918. And uh, that basically, I think, ended World War I. I think it was a big component of ending it, although you can't really find that in the history books uh, too much, that claim. You know, people like to, you know, end wars and say that it's both sides, you know, coming to an agreement or, or whatever. But, uh, you know, so many people were being lost but from the flu on both sides that uh, they were running out of, out of people to fight. So the war ended, the armistice, November 11th, uh, 1918. And then, you know, six months later, the third wave hit. And the third wave was as severe as the second wave, but people weren't traveling. The war wasn't being fought, so there were far fewer people. You know, they were able to focus mostly on the influenza and for you know they weren't fighting a war at the time so i'm just going to walk along the boardwalk here um, as i discuss things so first of all i want to talk about some of the uh passages i'm reading this book i bought this book in december uh 2019 so i was in madrid at the climate conference got sick you know, picked up this book uh, shortly after I returned home to Ottawa, put it aside, and then of course when the coronavirus was, was starting to take off, I thought I'd better read it, which I did, and I talked about it briefly in a previous video at the time, but I'm revisiting it, rereading it again, because there's a few things in there that I'm looking to find for references. But in terms of, I'm going to read some passages from this book. It's um, of course, you know, in 2018, it, well, it was published in 2018, which was the anniversary, the 100th year anniversary of the Spanish influenza. The author is Catherine Arnold. And let me just uh, pick some of the passages out. Well, one of the things is, you know, the quote in the beginning is, it was the beginning of the route of civilization of the massacre of mankind. Okay, that quote is actually from In War of the Worlds. Um, H.G. Wells, of course, as the aliens had arrived, you know, that was uh, one of the terms in his, in his book. Um, the captain of a ship, the HMS Cephalonia, in the North Atlantic in 1918, the quote is, the captain looked suddenly tired. Sometimes I think, Mr. Benson, that the very air is poisoned with the damned influenza. For four years now, millions of rotting corpses have covered a good part of Europe, from the Channel to Arabia. We can't escape it even when we're 2,000 miles out to sea. It seems to come as it did on our last trip, like a dark and invisible fog. Okay. Now... The, first of all, the name, the Spanish flu. In terms of national identity, there was nothing inherently Spanish about Spanish flu. At first, in the early months of 1918, the majority of doctors believed they were dealing with nothing more serious than a particularly aggressive outbreak of common or garden influenza. But as the epidemic continued and the King of Spain fell victim along with many of his subjects, this virulent strain of, strain of influenza was discussed freely in the Spanish media. 
okay? Uh, debate of this nature was possible in Spain because Spain was a neutral country during the First World War. In Britain and the United States, censorship made speculation impossible beyond the pages of medical journals such as The Lancet and the British Medical Journal. Under DORA, D-O-R-A, or the Defense of the Realm Act, newspapers were not permitted to carry stories that might spread fear or dismay. As the term Spanish flu entered the language in June 1918, okay, the Times of London took the opportunity to ridicule the disease as little more than a passing fad. By the autumn of 1918, when the second deadly wave of the Spanish flu was hitting populations worldwide, the implications of the disease proved impossible to ignore. The U.S. recorded 550,000 deaths, five times its total military fatalities in the war. European deaths totaled two million. Okay, in, 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 in England and Wales, an estimated 200,000, 4.9 people per thousand perished from influenza and its complications. Okay, so, you know, the first wave was basically a uh, trial run. The second wave came with a uh, vengeance. Okay. Um, another parallel is the idea that there's lots of finger pointing and conspiracy theories about the uh, origins of, of, uh, of the uh, virus. Now, they didn't know it was a virus then. They thought it was a bacterial infection. They didn't even know what viruses were because they were too small to be seen until the discovery of the electron microscope much, much later. You can't see something, you know, the, the, the virus diameter is 50 to 200 nanom uh, nanometer or billionth of a meter. You basically can't detect them with optical microscopes. You need something called an electron microscope. And that wasn't uh, invented yet. Okay, so... Um, the origins of the flu. Some argue that the Spanish flu originated in the battlefields of France as a mutation from animal flu. Others claim that it wasn't influenza, but a strain of bubonic plague from China. Okay. Many believe the flu to be man-made in origin, with claims being made that it had been distributed by... Sorry by German U-boats on the eastern uh, seaboard or circulated in Bayer aspirin packs. Okay, in highly religious communities, it was seen as a divine punishment for humanity's sinful nature in general and for starting a war in particular. Okay, many survivors and eyewitnesses speculated that the original cause was the millions of corpses rotting in no man's land combined with the lingering effects of mustard gas. Okay, these explanations continue to be discussed to this day. Okay, so, uh, you know, the connection to the Bayer aspirin, Bayer's a German company. Okay, so that's just, so that was, uh, you know, how that rumor got started. So the point is, is there's all kinds of, you know, rumors, people wanted to call it the German flu, etc. And uh, none of them have panned out. Okay. Um, and uh, another thing is that influenza at that time was not a, in quotes, notable disease, meaning that it had to be reported to the public. Like a notable disease would have to be reported to the public health authorities, but it didn't even need to be reported because it wasn't a notable disease. And also... The government suppressed warnings of the, of the influenza because, for the sake of national morale. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, when the, when the uh, second wave came, you know, basically, I mean, people were coughing up blood, choking to death on their pus-filled lungs, faces turning blue, and the labored breathing produced a duck-like quack. Okay, um, blood was drawn from some of the people as they were in the sixth state, and it became black and gummy, viscous as tar. 
in a very very short period of time okay and uh, you know it was called you know the invisible death or they just didn't know what was going on you know they didn't know uh, what was causing it and another thing is that there was a big difference in the death rates between people that lived in the cities or were from the cities and uh, from the country. City dwellers acquired some level of immunity to respiratory diseases because they live in an atmosphere frequently or constantly bearing these infections. Country boys are much high, more highly susceptible to the respiratory disease. And it killed them, you know, in the thousands upon thousands. Um, they called them doughboys. Um, you know, the American uh, infantry. And, uh, you know, it was downplayed and downplayed and stuff. And then, uh, you know, stories started coming out, for example. Oh, this passage here is particularly horrifying. Okay. A funeral that was making its way along a central street saw to the amazement of those who witnessed it, the coach driver fall from his seat to the ground dead as if struck by lightning. And one of the mourners keeled over on the ground, also having died suddenly. Panic gripped the others who were part of the procession and they scattered, leaving the coach abandoned. An ambulance had to come collect the dead and the municipal guard tied a cord to the horse's bridle and walking ahead some 12 meters, pulled the coach to the, to the cemetery. Okay, so, you know, it just goes on and on. A doctor was stopped in the street by a woman who said she was suffering from influenza and while he was talking with her she collapsed and died almost immediately okay so there's all kinds of different horror stories um, the first wave did not make it significantly to africa it didn't make it to sub-saharan africa but the spanish lady made a protracted and devastating visit to the african continent in the second wave, which was August 1918, killing 50 million people in Africa over the course of six months and leaving a catastrophic effect on the demographic, which lasted into subsequent generations. Okay, and I'll just read a couple more things. Um, well, you get the idea. You know, kids in grade three had this song at the time I had a little bird, and its name was Enza. I opened the window and influenza. There you go. Okay, so basically, the world after the first wave, you know, a lot of the virologists were still extremely concerned about what was going to happen, about second waves, third waves, etc. In fact, some of them were saying it wasn't a matter of if it's going to happen. It's a matter of when. And they expected it to be in the fall of 1918, but the government was fighting a war. There was suppression of information. So, this, uh, so people were very much unprepared for the second wave. And, uh, and also, uh, you know, for the third wave, they were more prepared because the war had ended um, it, in late, uh, well, November 11th, the armistice, 1918. And then when the third wave came uh, in the uh, spring, I guess, spring, early summer of 2019, um, they'd already, they, they were more prepared. So the, it was as virulent as it was in the second wave, uh, but uh, they were more prepared. So I guess a couple key things are the strains, the strength of the strains can vary, doesn't necessarily get weaker as some people think, as you go on with time. And uh, a couple other interesting points in this book was there was uh, some anecdotes, uh, like outdoor field hospitals that had a 10% mortality rate were in the same regions uh, as indoor hospitals, and they had a 30% fatality rate. So having people outside is a very encouraging thing, and that, cor that seems to correlate well with the study um, a Chinese study that I talked about in some previous videos about contact tracing, over 7,000 cases and only two, two of them, there was only one outdoor transmission that was recorded in the case study. This is very much an indoor disease. Maybe we should all put tents in the yard, be outside. Thanks.